All right, we're here for Let's Have a Chat, and I have Sarah Unsicker, and I didn't ask if I was getting that last name right, so hopefully I'm getting it right. Uh, That's state right. Representative, okay, perfect. <laughs> state Representative in Missouri from the 91st District. So, Representative Unsicker, thank you very much for joining me for this chat, and how are you doing tonight? I'm all right. Glad, I'm glad to be here. It's nice to see you, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm the state representative for the 91st district, like you said, which yeah. represents parts of St. Louis County, um, Webster Groves, Shrewsbury, Crestwood. Right now, it's got a couple of precincts in the in St. Louis City, but okay. not very much. And I know in the new district maps, I won't have any of St. Louis City. Oh, wow. So but, that's, a, that's yeah. a pretty big shift for you. Well, it's not a, it's not a huge shift, actually, because sure. I have so little of St. Louis City. Oh, okay. Okay. So you're mostly going to be south of the city then? West. West. Okay. See, this is, I used to know my St. Louis geography better (laughs) from that side of the state, and I've been uh, derelict on that. So, well, let's, let's jump into, from a chat standpoint, let's have a chat you and I were messaging a little bit about, about doing this. And you had a tweet earlier today um, that you shared that was very interesting. So I want to start there. You said, had a great conversation with the new director of children's division at DHS, uh, DH, DSS, that one's hard to say, Missouri. I'm looking forward to working with him to make things better for children in the most challenging circumstances in Missouri. So A, why is that an important issue for you? And B, what do you think is new? Why do you think, why are you encouraged? So I'm a lawyer. My career has been mostly family law. Um, I was a guardian ad litem in family drug court in St. Louis City. I have... My great apologies lot- as somebody who does guardian ad litem work and <laughs> does juvenile court work. I uh, That's a very... Sp- so we, we could probably spend an hour just recording about that, but we'll, I'm sure we could. <laughs> we'll stay on topic. <laughs> we can talk about that offline. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. My goal as a state representative has always been to make Missouri a better place for kids and families. Mm-hmm. I ran as a mother of young children, um, mostly because I didn't see parents of young kids being represented, right? at least not moms. And I think the interests and the perspective that I bring as a mom of young kids is different than what I saw in the legislature in 2016 when I ran. There are a lot more moms of young kids now than there were when I started running. So I'm glad to see that. Yeah, that has been a nice uh, shift because it does bring, you know, it's, and it's not just that it brings more female voices to the table. It's that it's bringing those voices of folks who are that frontline caretaker. Because I, I think people who aren't in that zone all the time, whether you've never been in the zone or maybe you were, but you're out of it. There's mm-hmm. only, like, I, you know, I think just our self-preservation doesn't ever allow us to actually remember the reality of what that is. <laughs> <laughs> because it's too terrifying. <laughs> well, and things move so fast. My kids really are does. in late elementary and middle school now, and yeah. it's hard to remember what it was like when they were in preschool, even though that was just a few short years ago. Right. Yeah. Once they start picking up a fork and going to the bathroom, it's <laughs> life really changes. <laughs> it does. So what's the encouragement? What What do you think is, you know, you, you feel like it's going in the right direction with Children's Division? I think so. So Children's Division has a new director. He started last week, Judge Daryl Missy. He was a judge in Jefferson County, okay. and he's done a lot of family court work there. Um, I think he started his career as a guardian ad litem, and he did a lot of family court, family law as an attorney before he became a judge and was doing working in the family courts there. I feel like we're we're using one of those phrases that you and I um, just casually say guardian ad litem. And it's not it's actually not that fancy of a thing. But so for for folks who are not versed in in that stuff, a guardian ad litem is just a third party attorney who's appointed for the best interest of children in a, in a legal case. So uh, not necessarily the child's attorneys, but they look out for the child. And uh, like I always say, my best interest is to eat broccoli. But if I didn't have somebody telling me that, I would just eat Taco Bell. So that's sort of... The <laughs> Is that how it works? <laughs> yeah, essentially. <laughs> Somebody to come in the room and go, look, I understand, but we have to eat our broccoli. That's a good good analogy. So um, he understands the family courts. And we had a conversation after the Children and Families Committee hearing today. Mm-hmm. And I'm really excited to have him there. First of all, he understands that putting kids in foster care is traumatic for the child. Right. No matter what. And I don't think that's been acknowledged enough. Yeah. 
in. We always hear the phrase that kids are resilient, kids are resilient, kids are resilient. Right. The, the more we've learned about trauma and, and you and I may have been at some of the same trainings, uh, you know, where you get the, the family law training at the, at the seminar and there's the trauma informed life GAL track mm-hmm. training and, and uh, you know, stuff that you don't even think about. It's pin drop kind of stuff, but those ripples go across that pond all the way to the shore every single time. Absolutely. Yeah. So I've never been a foster child, but I was a exchange student during high school. And I remember when my first host family said they didn't want me there anymore. And that was traumatic for me. I had my own family to go home to at the end of that experience. So it wasn't a a pretty old age too, like compared to a lot of foster that would, you know, when kids go into foster, there are older kids in foster, but Mm -hmm. typically it's going to begin in a younger age. There are all age, there are all ages of kids in foster care. Right. When You feel unwanted as a child. It's traumatic. Mm -hmm. And when you have to leave your parents without wanting to, without any preparation, it's traumatic. Mm -hmm. And we need to work to reduce that trauma Yeah. um, Yeah. to improve kids. So how do you think that's going to happen? So first of all, we need to work on prevention services. We do very little in Missouri to do prevention services. What kind of services are those? um, Services with families to help families get more stable. Um, There are about 230 kids in foster care right now who are there just because of inadequate housing. Wow. And if we could fix the housing situation for those kids, they wouldn't have to be in foster care. That's a big number. I mean. It's a huge number. Yeah. And just just housing. Yeah, just housing. We're not talking about parents who are absent for drugs. We're not talking about parents who are abusive or neglectful. We're just talking about housing. Just that simple. Just housing. And that's a small percentage of the kids in foster care. There are about 14,000 kids in foster care, and we're talking about 230 kids just for housing. But that's 230 individual children um, who are in there just for housing reasons. So, you know, if we can take care of things like that and things like the family doesn't have enough food, you know, and right. those kind of poverty issues, then we could really reduce the number of kids in foster care. Is there any particular gap? You know, we've heard a lot in the last year in Missouri about Medicaid, right, and the gap where mm-hmm. uh, that, that that covers. Uh, we also know that even with the expansion, there's still a gap. There's, there's still that group. Right. Is there a similar kind of thing with housing where there's just this sort of gap area that is not, it's big, but it's not insurmountable and that we could actually just do something about it. Well, the problem with housing is there's not enough affordable housing and affordable housing doesn't always have four and five bedroom Mm -hmm. units, which Mm -hmm. a large family might need. Um, And affordable housing isn't always available everywhere. It's one of those phrases to affordable housing that has, you know, it's a, it's a softer phrase than what people mm-hmm. used to use, but it still sort of conjures up this sort of apartment, maybe condo-like setting, two, three bedrooms, you know, lots of units all together. And I, I wonder if we, like, is it the kind of problem where if we just tilted that on its head and said, why are we worrying about building affordable housing? Why don't we worry about making housing affordable? Can mm-hmm. we do it that way? Or is that just yeah. too, you know... Was that just one of those really stupid, simple kind of hyperbolic (laughs) phrases that politicians might use? (laughs) I mean, affordable housing is built with tax credits Mm -hmm. and it's built using different financial models. Mm -hmm. So that's part of why it's in a category of its own is because the profit stream is different than a typical residential home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Enough housing that's affordable is really the issue or part of the issue. Um, is that something then, that you think the new director is going to be talking about as far as potential solutions and that we can maybe push a little bit? I hope so. Um, he wants to work on, um, on prevention and intervention services. Okay. And we haven't talked, we didn't talk about exactly what that looks like, Okay. but I hope that's something he'll, he'll advocate for so that families have housing if they need it. It's definitely good that that's where the conversation is starting. The the, the yes. prevention, you know, the prophylactic instead of the reaction is is definitely a very wise thing. Because like you say, that the trauma of just even a, a short stay um, mm-hmm. can be such a big impact. I know uh, 
experienced that recently with, uh, there was a local family and, you know, they, they put on a local Facebook page about, Hey, we're taking these kids in. We didn't really know until the last second, uh, you know, they're here are their ages, their, you know, younger ages. Uh, uh, we don't have any toys, right. Just like such a simple thing that you don't even think about like these kids or whatever they know every day to play with is gone, right. It's just mm-hmm. gone. And now maybe there's nothing, maybe there's something, maybe there's something different, but it's not their thing. It's not their comfort. It's not their place. Right. Well, let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Hey folks, just a quick break to remind you, you can check us out on Twitter with at the heartland pod. You can send us an email heartlandpod2020 at gmail.com and check us out online to get links to all of our shows and to our Patreon account. So you can become a pod head or a pod aggressive. You can help support what we're doing here to help us change the conversation. You can go to heartlandpod.com and click on the Patreon link. Or if you have a Patreon account, you can simply search for us heartland pod inside of there and you can sign up Today, five bucks a month gets you access to at least a couple of extra shows a month, plus the blog that we have there with pieces by myself, Rachel Parker, and that's going to continue to grow. And there's going to be more and more coming. We've we've been building it slowly, but there's more to come. So uh, let's get back now to my chat with Representative Sarah Unsicker. All right, well let's let's jump into the session because you guys are what well, you're about a week in now, getting everybody's getting their feet wet. How are things going? How do you feel about the 2022 Missouri legislative session? I feel like we've jumped into the deep end. (laughs) (laughs) And what's in the pool, I guess, is the other question, right? (laughs) Trying to figure that out. So one of the biggest things we're working on right now is redistricting. Mm -hmm. Um, They're which means they're drawing new district lines. They have to do this every 10 years. Right. Um, yeah, we had a nice, then, uh, if people want a really uh, nice detail on redistricting, just kind of process and sort of political stuff. Uh, we had Jason Rosenbaum on from uh, St. Louis Public Radio okay. on Tuesday's show. So that's a great one to go back and grab. It's it's a nice short interview that Rachel Parker did with him. So what, what redistricting right now, um, you're in the house. How are things going in the house? Things are going okay. Um, we The committee voted out a map today. And that was the Um, six to two map. That that was the six to two map. There's some controversy. I know the conservative caucus wants a seven to one map. Sure. Um, And so does Missouri right to life. Sure. Of course. But we're a 60, 40 state. Mm -hmm. We, you know, if you look at our voting pattern, sometimes closer than that. Yeah. And to have a nine 90, 10 map, really disenfranchises a lot of voters. Sure. It means that there's not proportional representation in Missouri. Mm -hmm. And I think redistricting was intended, um, intended to do proportional representation. Well, you would think, I mean, we, (laughs) we make a point to figure out how many people there are. And then the rules are set up to try to make the districts encompass those people so you would think that that's the entire point of it. But of course, folks like, for example, uh, Representative Shore, who, uh, you know, put out today how outraged he is that they might possibly uh, split St. Charles County, while on the other hand, completely advocating to split Kansas City in three directions, like without even mm-hmm. blinking. Right. And let me remind you, your listeners, that Representative Shore doesn't even live in his district. <laughs> so. I would say we're beating a dead horse, but I think it's a horse we got to keep beating. I mean, it's it's an important issue. And, we, you know, we talk about it with Josh Hawley all the time, but it's the same mm-hmm. kind of thing where, you know, these people just are – how there are rules. The rules apply, and yet somehow in these cases we just look at it and go, oh, ha, 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 don't worry about it. Yeah. So, so we're working through redistricting right now. It's going to come to the floor next week. We're going to hear the map and make amendments to it. Um, we have a time debate, which means each side has the same amount of time to talk if they choose to use all their time. So it's a, two, a four hour total debate. So two hours for each side. Okay. Um, and it's going to be quite an interesting debate. Well, I'm sure there'll be plenty of sound bites and videos that come out of it to I'm sure. be able to drop. So <laughs> be yeah. fun. It's been interesting too. Uh, the number of, I've noticed a ton of folks 
uh, going this year to session, going to the hearings and live tweeting what's going mm-hmm. on. A lot of threads, and it's it's really cool. It's really helpful because um, you know I'm 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 working as an attorney during the day, and so there's those days where some days I'm in court, and so I may not you know be able to check anything, but. When you're not, if you're working on paperwork, the ability to sort of see what's going on without having to listen to it and just sort of go, okay, let's catch up on the last four or five real quick and see what's going on. It's amazing, and and it's extremely helpful. So listeners who also do that, uh, Jessica Piper, looking at you, please keep doing that. It's very helpful. So let's talk goals 2022. Do you have any particular goals? Uh, You know, Are you part of a group that's got any particular goals that you're looking at? So my goals primarily are related to kids. I have a couple big bills that I'm working on. The first one is the Uniform Child Abduction Prevention Act. Okay. And that will keep parents who are in custody battles from abducting their child. It'll Talk let- about that. Explain that because that's yeah. that's something that uh, colloquially I've uh, used the phrase hide the baby. Maybe you've heard that one before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. So it doesn't let parents hide the baby from each other because when parents are in custody battles, it can be really contentious. Yeah. And it can be really contentious for 18 years. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a parent might just want to move the kid to another state and be done with it. Right. And if the other parent thinks that parent's going to do that, um, under this law, they would be able to go to the court and petition the court for an order preventing that from happening. So this is in addition to, because statutorily speaking, there is some protection for that already, right. um, that you're not supposed to remove a child, but it's, 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 not, a, it's not a guarantee that every, every family law case is going to have a specific order outlining this kind of stuff. Right. So it allows the judge to make that specific order outlining this kind of stuff. And um, it's a uniform law. It's already law in, I think, 18 states. And so states will recognize this. Mm-hmm. So if a parent moves that child to another state that's also uh, that also has the UCAPA law, the parent will be able to, or the other other parent will be able to make the state enforce the law. So this is this is a uh, something that's going to tack on to essentially the UCCJEA, the Uniform Child yes. Custody Jurisdiction Enforcement Act for folks where if you, and I think that's a 50 stater at this point, if I'm not uh, mistaken. I think so. I think we were one of the last ones to adopt that. Yes, we were. Um, <laughs> that, uh, but essentially, like you're saying, uh, it's almost it's almost a full faith and credit thing where our laws and your laws play together and everybody's going to enforce, you know, if I get a judgment over here that says uh, my ex has to pay me $800 a month in child support, if they go off to Kansas or Nebraska, they still have to pay me $800 a month in child support and that state will enforce that order. Exactly. So that's the first bill I filed this year. Another bill I filed is for educational stability for foster kids. So what this does is it requires the child to stay in their school of origin until a determination is made to move them to a different school. So if a kid goes into foster care in a neighboring town, under this law, they will have to keep going to school in their original school until there's a determination made to change that. And that meeting's supposed to take place within a couple days. So and mo- most like, of that stuff at the beginning of those kinds of cases is usually within a pretty tight time frame. So this would yeah. just be another so one I of think, those things. I think it's 72 hours yeah, yeah. that they have to have that meeting. So. Well, that, that's good. And that, that's a, a useful thing because that is, you know, again, in that stability for kids going into foster care. I mean, what a huge, you know, imagine waking up one morning and leaving your house, your toys, maybe a sibling, by the way. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, whoever your known caretaker has been, your school, all your friends, all your teachers, every adult that you trust and getting plopped down into a new place. And there's nobody to even evaluate whether or not that's wise or not. Exactly. So this makes the evaluation. um, It keeps the parent as educational determination, educational um, decision maker until a decision is made to make to make maybe the foster parent that decision maker or somebody else. So based on the rhetoric that we've been hearing about school choice, I have to imagine that this is going to have a ton of bipartisan support. I hope so. I mean, I would think genuinely, I would think so, because if they're going to be consistent, 
this would, you know, this is a parental rights. This is a genuine, is. let me say it that way, a genuine uh, <laughs> constitutional parental rights issue, which is a thing. There is actually a law about it that that is often being ignored in some of the current rhetoric that we hear about this stuff. But um, mm-hmm. but this this is an actual teeth to enforce that particular thing, which which is very, it sounds smart. It sounds like a good thing. Yes. Um, let's shift just a little bit. So we talked about, you know, you're in the St. Louis area. Um, I want to talk about Democratic support in Missouri in general, um, because I think, and that this is my theory, and I'm not asking you to, uh, you know, agree with anything I'm saying here. I just want to kind of have this conversation. Um, I'm not in the St. Louis area, right? Mm-hmm. And the the deeper I've gotten into Missouri politics, the more it feels like to me that there is, and I think it was unintentional, but that there was a sort of club mentality that developed because in the St. Louis area, there's a ton of Democratic legislatures. There's a ton of Democrats in general, and they're all pretty close together ge- geographically, physically speaking. Um, and so it creates a, a natural bond, a natural tight knit community. And then if you're outside of that, you know, I'm out West out in Johnson County in Warrensburg, and it feels almost like a different state, almost like a different country at times to where we don't walk and talk and play together and, and, and sometimes don't use the same rhetoric. And as a result, I think the state party has developed the same mentality. And so like I had, uh, uh, Jim Hogan on a couple of months ago, who's running in Southwest Missouri. It's his third time running. He'd never been contacted by the Missouri democratic party one single time running for state wow. uh, Senate down there. Mm-hmm. So, or, or representative, I forget, but, um, so that's that's sort of the example, uh, and I'm just wondering if that's something. Do you think I'm just way off base? Is there, you know, am I not no, seeing I think it right? A good point to that, and I think a lot of that is because the Democratic Party itself is kind of disjointed. There's several different parts of the Democratic Party. So the people in power are the Democratic Party, but we also have the House Democratic Caucus the Senate Senate Democratic Caucus and Mm -hmm. everybody wants to say and everybody has different opinions about how things should work. Sure. Yeah. It's sort of three heads of the family, so to speak. And then you've got all the, all the boots on the ground and all the outlying voters and all that stuff. But Mm -hmm. yeah, well, it's something that I hope, uh, you know, because I'm, I I talk a lot in this show about both parties and, you know, I'm sure that I say things from time to time that some of our listeners don't love about uh, the Democratic Party in general, um, because I'm, I try to be an observer. I have personal preferences when I vote, but I try to be an observer of what's just happening as objective as I can be. And I think that, I I don't think it was intentional, but I think that that's, it's got to change and it's got to be fixed. So we'll, we'll see. Hopefully it can be. Uh, certainly having folks like you who are very, very thoughtful with what you do and, you know, you seem less purely political and more sort of engaged on how, how can we genuinely make it better? And it's less mm-hmm. about the politics from that end. Exactly. I really want to work with both sides. I do a lot of, like I said earlier, I do a lot of issues with kids. Um, and I don't think that is partisan and I don't think it should be partisan. You yeah. know, our kids are our kids and we need to take care of them. Yeah. So uh, let, let's talk really quick about um, where you see things going this uh, session as far as, is there anything that you think is genuinely going to come out of this session? Uh, there's a lot of money to spend, and obviously mm-hmm. redistricting has to happen. So do you think that with all the folks that are jockeying for a position right now for for the next office that we're going to be able to get stuff done? And do you think that because of all the resignations – that that actually has opened a door here for for things to get done. It's definitely opened a door. They have, I think, 108 Republicans now in the House. Yeah, I think that's um, right. And they need 109 to override a veto or to um, pass an emergency clause to make a bill go into effect immediately. And so essentially, so, we're back to actually having to work together. Yes, we have we have to work together again now. So we have the Democrats have a lot more power that way, because especially with redistricting, it needs an emergency clause. If it doesn't have that emergency clause, it goes into effect on August 28th. And that's well, way that too feels late. like it's way too late. That is way <laughs> too late to have the election bill yeah. or the map become law, especially because the primary elections happen in early August. So, right. Well, and folks have to sign. I mean, if you don't even know, yeah. you mentioned that yours is probably going to shift. How do you know? 
Like, how do you know where you're campaigning? How do you know where you're mailing stuff? How do you know who you're trying to knock doors for? Um, that, that seems like a pretty massive issue. And I would think that that's a bipartisan issue that everyone would like to know what the district is that they're trying to run in. (laughs) Yeah. Right now, I don't know if I'm running in the 91st or the 82nd. I don't know which one I'll be in. So, man, that's, that's a pretty big change. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's, let's totally shift gears here. Uh, you've been generous with your time and I don't want to take up too much of it. You're in session. So I want to make sure you get some sleep here. Let's talk about your favorite things. All right, Representative Unsecker's favorite things, number one, your favorite famous Missourian. I know you're from Texas originally. I am. You're a Missouri rep now, so famous Missourian. I think Harry Truman. Okay. Very common answer from Democratic uh, uh, electeds. Why is that true for you? Just because he, I mean, he ended World War II. His policies were good. Let's get a little smaller and go... Your favorite thing about uh, being a representative? The relationships I've made, um, the people I connect with, and all the people I get to work with. That's my favorite thing about being a representative. That is easily the most common answer I get on that from uh, elected folks. And it seems, you know, it, it just feels like that has to be the best part of it. I mean, just, just getting to experience stories and, and firsthand accounts from folks and people who you genuinely can try to help. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like helping people. Um, but when I'm in session, it's the friendships I've made and the relationships I've made with people. And I mean, I think I have closer friends from the house, from being in the house than I've ever had before. All right. Final favorite thing, favorite hidden gem that you've discovered in your time in Jeff city. So there's a Jeff City is one of those places that you kind of have to spend a little bit of time there to just to, to really know what's going on because there's some there's some good stuff there. I would say Riverside Park because it has a lovely walking trail right by the river, and it's a nice peaceful place where I can go and just be. Sometimes, especially when spring's ha- spring is coming, and when I have some time there. You definitely strike me as a peaceful river walk kind of person. <laughs> Anybody who does as much family law and GAL work and then wants to get into the legislature so you can deal with those laws, that's that's a peacemaker if I've ever met one. Thanks. So what's okay. next for you? Senate? State Senate? I don't Congress? know you. I'm still trying to work that out. Run against Josh Hawley? It's actually Josh Hawley. <laughs> Josh Hawley. <laughs> Josh Hawley. Well, well, we won't hold you to anything. Yeah, I'm... I'm more of a policymaker than a politician, so I, I don't know what my next step is going to be. Well, we could use a few more policymakers in the state legislature where people are supposed to be making policy. So. Yes. <laughs> Representative Unsinger, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining me on the Heartland Pod, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you so much, Adam. I appreciate it. Thanks. Good luck with session. Thanks. The Heartland Pod is a production of Midmap Media, LLC. Follow us on Twitter with at the Heartland Pod. With email, you can reach us, heartlandpod2020 at gmail.com, online with heartlandpod.com, subscribe, and please sign up for our Patreon with patreon.com slash heartlandpod. Become a podhead or an official podgressive today and unlock all of our content. See you at the next show. <laughs>